It's Richard Ellis Talks with founding pastor of Reunion Church in the heart of downtown Dallas, Richard Ellis. Whether you find yourself in a good place or a difficult place, perhaps even in a very lonely place, you've come to the right place, a place to hear that you matter, to hear that you're loved, and that's something everyone desperately needs to hear. Now, if you're not able to enjoy today's entire program, just go to the website, richardellistalks.com. All of these video talks plus hundreds of audio talks are waiting to encourage you, challenge you, and to give you hope at richardellistalks.com. So with today's talk, here's Richard Ellis. The title of today's message is My Shot. Psalm 139. So this passage is used a lot, read a lot about uh, unborn children, that they're people, uh, which clearly is the case. And Psalm 139, verse 16, and this is talking here, the psalm is talking about what God sees and what he knows even before a person is born. Uh, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they are all written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. So God has already written the days of your book. Now track with me a minute. If God already knows who you are before your parts are formed even in the womb, and he, as it says here, and in, and in your book, they, are, they all were written, the, the days fashioned for me. So God says, I already know the days, how many you have. I know when you're going to be born. I know when you're going to die. And I know everything about your life. I know what's coming. How many days have you, have you wasted? You've only got so many. Uh, and anybody that starts to get older, you start going, this, this sand in this hourglass appears to be dropping a lot faster than it did when most of the sand was in the top. And I don't know how much sand's in the top anyway. Um, but he says, the, the day's fashioned for me. I got so many days left. What am I going to do with my shot? The only shot that I have. Now, people say, well, then you should work yourself to the bone. You, 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 have, you should never have any downtime. You should just sleep very little, work all the time, and accomplish all you can. Even Jesus didn't run that kind of crazy life. He rested. He stopped. He slept in a boat when there was a storm. I and mean, there's all kinds of instances. He got away by himself. But he didn't screw around and screw up his life, obviously, and waste any time. Uh, there's a reason for every day. There's, there's a reason why God puts you in the places he puts you every day. Luke chapter 4. Now, great thing, one of the other great things, many great things about Jesus is he came down here and showed us what it's about. Luke chapter 4, verse 42. Now, when it was day, he departed and went to a deserted place, and the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God in the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. What was Jesus doing? He only got 33 years down here. That was it. I think he knew he only had a short amount of time because he's God. But he maximized it by living a perfect, sinless life, which was only he could do. But he was, what was he doing? For this purpose, I have been sent. Why have you been allowed to die? This country, we have killed, what is it, up to almost 60 million unborn children are missing from our population. That's insanity. That's genocide. And somehow, I got born, you got born. You got a shot. What are you doing with that shot? You have to talk to the creator of the universe, the, the God that has saved you and that you claim to have a relationship with and say, look, I'm here for a reason. Show me my reason so that I can get on with this. And what does the devil say? Yeah, I bet he's got some good ideas, but I got some good ideas. Why don't we forget what God wants you to do? Because that's going to suck. It's going to be sacrifice, tribulation, persecution. I'm going to offer you some money. You can party, have a good time. Bada bing, bada boom. We'll move the coconuts around. You'll never know what happened. And then boom, you're out of here. Steal, kill, destroy. That's what he's got to offer. And people sign up every day and go, what happened to my life? I don't know. What happened to your life? You signed up for your life. You say, well, bad things happen to me. Respond to whatever has happened to you. Don't react. John chapter 4, 
verse 31. And he's had this interaction, and this is, I don't have time to read y'all John 4. John 4. They go into this town, this woman's at the well, and this is a perfect example of this. You say, well, this is God in the flesh, come to the earth, and he's sitting at a well with one woman. That's how much he values individuals. He didn't get to the well, and the disciples go into town to get food, and he goes, well, ma'am, you know, I'm God in the flesh and everything, and if there was more people here gathered at the well, I could preach or something, but I don't do stuff for just one person. So sorry if you just, you know, I'm very important. I'll be over here in the VIP section of the well or whatever. <laughs> She's the person there that all the universe had collided in that moment. She was there, he was there, and she ended up being the person that reached the whole city because she had been married to half the men in town. So, I mean, you know, it's just, it's a great story. Okay. So verse 42, now, now when it was, uh, in the meantime, his disciples, verse 31, in the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat, which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything? Like we went in town to get food. Did, did somebody bring him food? Like, what is he talking about? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That's what he's on the planet for. What are you on the planet for? I'm on the planet still to do what? To finish his work. My brain works a certain way. Creativity, whatever, if, you know, the humor's terrible sometimes, but my brain works a certain way. If I were not a pastor, I would probably do some kind of advertising. I love that kind of stuff. People say, oh, you ought to do that on the side. I don't need an on the side. I don't need to be, get entangled in the, the affairs of this world. I have a job to finish. You say, well, are you okay with doing that? How could you not be okay with doing what God made you to do? What could be more fulfilling than that? Yeah, but you, you may never be rich or anything. Let me tell you something. You come by my house in heaven. And we'll see how it works out on the other side. If you're only focused on this side, you're focused on the side where it's all going to get burned. You're taking none of this with you. All of my stuff, I'm shipping ahead. Ship it ahead. You say, well, how do you do that? It's all about people. Think about this. And I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to get you to think. If you died today made heaven, God blows the horn, the whistle, and it's all over, and everything's accounted for, and you held a reception in your home in heaven, how many people would you expect at your reception? Who's coming? Oh, what do you mean? You tell me what I mean. What'd you give your life to? Who'd you talk to? Who would come up to you and say, Man, you don't remember me, but you smiled at me in the grocery store. You were kind to me. You said, God bless you. I was about to blow my brains out. And then I met somebody else three people later, and they led me to Christ. But you're part of that chain. Or did you just get so deceived, the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, all this other stuff? Like, I don't have time for that. It's all about me. I got my ticket to heaven. It's all about me. You don't just get a ticket to heaven. You get a whole ticket book. You're supposed to be handing them out. Free. What you got there? Ticket to heaven. How much? Free. Not possible. I got one. Here's how I got mine. You want one? You can have one. Free? Free. I'm a scumbag. Me too. Free. <laughs> I got you some scumbag cleaner right here. Free. And people go, wow, this is crazy. I've been waiting for somebody to tell me this my whole life. They pray a simple prayer and their whole life changes and they go, wow, so how do you live? Well, I'm going to heaven, but I'm trying to make a difference before I get out of here because I only got one shot. And they go, I want a piece of that. I'd like my life to make a difference. See, the devil's lied to you and said you're nobody. You'll, you'll never accomplish anything. You're just lucky you're going to make heaven. You got no verses for that. You got verses for God living in you and through you and can transform you in the world if you'll just get out of the way and let him do it. And then finish Luke, uh, John chapter 4. 
My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they're already white for the harvest. Don't be waiting. The harvest is now. It's now. You don't have to wait. John chapter 9. A man born blind. And Jesus heals him. There's a big argument. Well, did he sin or did his his family sin? He's like, dude, there's nothing about anybody sinning here. This guy was born blind that the works of God might be declared. And that he was born blind so I could show up here right now and heal him. Verse uh, 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, what if God said, look, you know, if you could talk, have a meeting before you're even born. Yeah, it's going to sound terrible, but uh, you're going to be born. You're going to be blind. What? Yeah, I know everybody's not blind, but you got picked. You're, you're the blind guy. Really? From birth? Yeah, from birth. So is it going to be my fault? No, because you haven't even been born yet. My parents' fault? No, not their fault. So what are we doing? Well, See, I'm coming to earth during your lifetime. I'm going to be born of a virgin, and I'm going to live, and I'm coming to town one day. And the whole reason for you being born blind, and I'm going to heal you, but everybody's going to know who I am because you were born blind, that's just how it was, and that's going to be one of my ways of telling them who I am. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll be, 40 years I'm going to be blind so you can show off. <laughs> and prove that you're God. What would you be willing to have and live if God said, I'm going to use it for my glory? Right? Well, God, I can't hear well. I'll use it for my glory. I'll either heal you or I'll use it for my glory. I'm missing something. You're probably not missing anything. Go back and read Psalm 139. Fearfully, wonderfully made. So keep reading that. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. And your translation could have one of two words here, I or we. King James, New King James translates it I. Your translation may have the word we. It can be either way. I, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is a day. While it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. What does that mean? You worked daylight back then. There's no electricity. You had to work when you had daylight. And he's the light of the world. He's leaving. You got to work while you can. Night is coming. You won't be able to work. Um, I'm not, I've told you before, I'm not afraid of dying unless it gets really messy and I won't be crazy about it, but I'll go with it. Uh, I don't, I don't really fancy, um, you know, if you get Alzheimer's, you don't know you've got it, so it's just a pain in the butt and all your kids. Um, but if you just physically can't do what you used to be able to do and you're, and, and you're just somewhere, it's very frustrating for people because night has come and they can't work like they used to. I'm telling you, and it's hard. The younger you are, the harder this is to hear. You better take your shot now. And keep taking it because you don't know how long the rest of your life is. John 17. He's praying to the Father, and we get a copy of the prayer. And down in verse 4, he says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. If you knew you were going to be dead in a few days and you were talking to the Father, could I, could you, could we with confidence say to him, I have finished the work that you have given me to do. You allowed me to be born. You allowed me to be born again. You gave me life. You gave me a, a new life. And I have finished the work which you gave me to do. I'm ready to go. 
and know I'm going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Why would you hear that? Because you did the work that he gave you to do. Now, please don't ever misunderstand this. If you want to know who I really am, and I'm not suggesting this or offering this, you go spend a little time with the redhead. Because she knows I'm not all that. Not as much as God knows it. But in the midst of me not being all that, I am still taking my shot. And if and when I go down, I'm going to get back up off my rear and keep shooting. And you say, well, I went down. Then if you can't get up by yourself, you call me, you call somebody and say, I need help getting back up because I'm clearly not dead, so it must not be over. There must be something left to do. You say, well, what about the mess that I made or the messes that I'm making? God is amazing in, in this regard. You go back to the peril of the sower. If you're looking for good soul, soil, find you some manure, just a pile of you know what. You say, well, that's all I got to offer God. Give him that. Shove a seed in that, and you got you something. You say, well, God doesn't want my manure. I'm being kind. He wants you and if that's what you got at the moment, give him something to work with. So you got a terrible story. Everybody's got a terrible story. The blind man, I don't know what you guys are arguing about. I once was blind, now I see. And you sit down with somebody and you say, well, I'm embarrassed of my story. They're embarrassed of their story and they don't have an answer for theirs yet. So you tell them what your struggle was and how God saved you and forgave you and then they go, dude, I've never heard anything like that. So you think there's hope for me? Yeah, there's hope for you. And then they get saved. You say, well, I don't have, I don't have a plan. Let me tell you, now listen close. At home or wherever you are. If you say, I don't have a plan, you're wrong. You have a plan because the default plan is to do nothing. The default plan is to fall into walking and living in the flesh and just whatever feels good, you go with that and see what happens. I'll tell you what will happen. You may make heaven because you got your ticket. You'll have to answer, though, for the wasted time and the, and the opportunities that are lost. And people say, well, but if someone's going to get saved, they're going to get saved anyway. It's not about me, right? That's like saying you pass someone bleeding on the side of the road and go, ah, new car, I don't want to mess my seats up. Somebody else will stop. Except that they could die before the, the somebody else that would or could stop shows up. Stop, help the person. And why would you make someone suffer? I don't, want, I don't, I don't want to be lost without Jesus. I can't imagine not having him in my life. So you're going to tell somebody basically, you know, whatever you, I'm having a bad day. God's not been nice to me. I'm not happy. So whatever you, and I'm going to go on and somebody else will have to take care of you. What in the world? Wake up and say, God, man, I'm not, I, I'm not feeling great, but I know I'm here. So use me. You got to pray these prayers. You got to, you got to, you got to sign in in the morning. I'm here. I'm ready. This is the day the Lord has made. What are you going to do with it? We will rejoice and be glad in it. But you don't know my circumstances. Your circumstances have nothing to do with your decision to rejoice and be glad in a day. And I go back to this too much probably, but I, I can't get my head around people born slaves, human beings born slaves, die slaves, and have joy their whole lives. You think you got trouble? Wait till the day you realize I have been born in captivity and it's probably never going to change. And someone tells you about Jesus and he says, this world is not your home. And no matter what they do to you, they can't steal your joy. They can beat you. They can torture you. They can string you up, but they can't steal your joy. And then you got black slaves with joy writing music. Where does this come from? From suffering, from pain. I'm not endorsing slavery, but I'm endorsing rejoicing and being glad in it no matter what. My grandson said, amen, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> you got to stop coming up with excuses. Enough already with the excuses. Well, blah, 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 this is not fair. Blah, whatever. Whatever. 
And then stuff starts happening. You're like, what in the world? Are you going to get shot at? Sure you're going to get shot at. It is a stinking war. Stop being surprised that they're shooting back. Draw your sword, the word of God, and march on the gates of hell. The book says they cannot prevail against you. I'm not hiding out in my fort. I'm attacking their fort. And you go behind enemy lines and you take people who are held captive and say, you want to go with me and be free? Follow me. Here's your ticket. And all the demons have to step out of the way because they got nothing to come back with when you got Jesus. Greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. I got verses after verses after verses. Uh, all right, we're almost out of here. All right, Philippians chapter 3. I got to I read this one probably along the way because it's a tremendous visual, at least for me. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. And this is Paul writing to the church at Philippi. And he's also saying, I'm not saying I'm all that. I haven't arrived. Verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. So here's the illustration. I normally get somebody up here. So God reaches up and grabs you by the arm and says, I got you and I got a reason for laying a hold of you. And you go, wow, this is crazy. But what is my response? I grab him back and say, okay, I'm not letting go. You're not letting go. You got to tell me why you've gotten a hold of me. I want to lay hold of that for which he has laid hold on me. So God reached down and grabbed your life. You got to grab back and say, okay, why'd you grab me? Why did you pick me? Why have you got a hold of my life? You've laid hold of me. Now I'm going to lay hold of you. To, and for what purpose? For that which Christ has, has also laid hold on me. <sighs> Grab him back. Hold on for dear life. Let him show you. You say, but I got plans. You don't want any plans that are not his plans. You got goals. You don't want any goals that are not his goals. I got dreams. Ask him for your dreams. But if I give up all this stuff, what will I have? Just Jesus. That's all you'll have. And the reason he made you. But I was supposed to, who said? I dreamed it up. Now you say, well, if, if I yield my life to God, is he going to send me off to some dark, you know, where everybody thinks? Why don't you ask him? Just say, Lord, here's what I had in mind. Here's what I had in my heart. But I would be terrified to think that what I want is not what you want. So here's what I want, and I'll sacrifice it. I'll lay it down on some altar and say, if this is what you had for me, great. If not, you can have it and show me what you had. Then you're free. And then he blesses you, and you go, wow. I don't have to live with anxiety and fear. Um, I will probably not die a rich man, but I'm already a rich man. I got wife who loves me, forgives me. I got kids who love me. I got family here, his family. I'm going to have family on the other side. You got nothing you can offer me to beat what he's offered me. Eternal and abundant life. What you got going to trade in for that? It's interesting, if you go back and study basketball, I did a little research in uh, whether it's Michael Jordan or you can name any number, Kobe, uh, he took his last shot. Um, something interesting about taking a shot, a winning shot, you have to be in the game. They don't count warm-up shots. You've got to be in the game. You say, well, how to get in the game? It's as simple as a conversation with a living God. And you say, God, I don't know why I didn't get this before today, but I finally get it. I see who you are. I understand now and believe that you love me. You sent your only son, Jesus, to die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead, to pay for my sin, and to offer me eternal and abundant life. As crazy as this sounds and is, I got nothing to offer you for it, but I'd be a fool not to say yes and thank you. And you accept eternal life as a gift 
and he comes and lives in you and through you and changes you. And then he begins to show you what he intended for and with your life. And then you go, wow, this is what I was made to be and do. And people always say to me, it can't be that easy. And what do I say? Easy for who? Easy for you because all you got to do is say yes and thank you. Not so easy for him. It cost him his son's life. Jesus had to die on that cross, be buried and raised from the dead. But that's how it works. And our Father, I thank you so much for your word. And I pray that it would fall on good ground. And especially for people today, Lord, who may have just prayed or are about to pray the biggest prayer they'll ever pray in their lives, make the biggest decision a human being can make, where they will spend eternity and how they will spend this life. I pray for those, Lord, who are in the midst of saying yes, that you would give them the faith to believe, the courage to just step forward in their heart and in their mind and say, God, I cannot push you away any longer. I say yes. I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I accept the gift of eternal life, the forgiveness of my sins. Come live in me, through me, change me. Thank you for saving me right now. Now don't just live in my life, but live through my life and help me take my shot, which really is your shot through me, Lord, and accomplish what it is you have for me to do and for me to be. And Father, for those of us who are believers, who have been Either we put ourselves on the bench or we just never got in the game in the first place and it's time. And we would confess whatever sin. You said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if it's sin that's got to go, then let that be confessed and dealt with. If it's rebellion, pride, arrogance, fear, whatever it is the enemy has gotten us to buy into and trade in, on the life that you intended, Lord, help us deal with that now and get back on track and back to living and doing and being what you made us to do. You're the best. Thank you for another day. Help us pay attention, Lord, this day to the people around us, the opportunities that we have, and always be ready to give a reason for the hope that's within us. And you are that reason. And we pray it in your sweet, your precious name, in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd love to keep this conversation going with you anytime on the website richardellistalks.com. There you'll find the full version of today's talk, plus hundreds more of Richard's challenging and encouraging audio and video talks. Then discover over a thousand cities where Richard Ellis Talks is broadcast. Or you can share a request on the prayer wall. Plus, if you'd like to consider a gift, learn how to join the financial partnership team and so much more at richardellistalks.com. So let's meet again here next time to talk about how God is ready to change your life starting today with Richard Ellis Talks.